Welcome to our center's first virtual cooking program. We are thrilled to have New Delhi's chef Ranjan Day with us. He's going to show us how to make a chicken curry, and he has a cocktail recipe for you too. We hope you have your ingredients with you, and you're going to have fun cooking along with Chef Ranjan. If you're like me and you already ordered takeout from New Delhi, I hope you enjoy eating it. And if you want to put in that order, you can do it until 8 o'clock tonight. Chef Ranjan has been a longtime supporter of Asia Society, and for that, we are very grateful to him. We know this has been a tough time for the restaurant business, and we want to show support to him and show support to the community here. Another chef who has been supportive to us has been Chef Kathy Fang. She is our moderator today. Uh, we have seen her, you may have seen her on the Food Network, uh, the TV show Chopped, where she was champion. And she runs Fang, which is down the street on Howard Street. Um, and she also, uh, with her father, runs the House of Nanking, which is another San Franciscan uh, institution. So we're so pleased and grateful to Kathy for being here, too. We are so missing the restaurant experience, and we are working hard to bring that experience to all of you at home. So we really hope you enjoy today's program. Our format for today, Kathy will introduce Ranjan. He'll do a cooking demonstration. Then they'll have a moderated discussion, and we'll open Open it up to Q&A. If you have questions, you can go ahead and start entering them now in the chat box, uh, the Q&A box via text at the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and enter them. Uh, the program will end at five o'clock and then we're going to have a special treat for you. You can meet the chefs. We can see your recipes, but you can chat with them uh, in person uh, in, uh, on camera. So without further ado, Kathy, thank you again so much for being with us. Thank you, Margaret, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm Chef Kathy Fang, and I'm thrilled to be here today to introduce Chef Ron John. Um, I kind of see Chef Ron John as my father. Um, they actually both opened their restaurants back in 1988, and you know he, we were just talking earlier about how he the restaurant is such a personal thing to him, and not being able to serve customers in person is very difficult during this time. So. I'm absolutely thrilled to be the one introducing him and having him share his cooking and food with all of us today. So without further ado, Chef Ron John, do your thing. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Margaret. This is an amazing program. I welcome all of you for joining me. You know, during this time, it is a little tough time for all of us. So this will be a fun event. I want to start by saying namaste. So namaste is an ancient Indian greeting. By putting these two hands together, left hand represents the light in my soul. The right hand represents the light in your soul. By putting together, I'm recognizing that we coexist and we can coexist in harmony, peace, and by making room for each other. So namaste and welcome to my cooking show. So we'll start by doing the nimbu pani. I hope all of you have the ingredients. So I am going to take the ingredients, show it to you. There is lemon and lime juice right here. We have some sliced lemon, some sliced lime for garnish, some ice, rose water, and then I have some sugar. So I'm going to add the sugar to this nice jar and add, it's so easy, you know, add the lemon and lime juice, add a few drops of rose water. I made a hole on the top, so it's easy for me to pour. Just mix it up a little. And then I have a little fizzy water and some still water, half and a half. And that's how easy it is. Still water. And then just a little swirl to mix it up. Looks, look, looks beautiful. I'm going to pour myself some so while I am doing this, I can enjoy this. Garnish with a slice of lime, slice of lemon, and I'm ready. So let's start. Mm. 
we have some vodka. Anybody want to add a shot of vodka? Please do. You know, for me, I just want to make sure I can just keep on talking and don't revert into my very, very good Indian accent so you wouldn't understand what I'm saying after I have like four of those shots. So I'm just going to stay with the plain one for the time being. And when I'm talking to you later on, I have some vodka as well. So let's start. All right, I'm going to bring in all the ingredients. What this chicken curry? I hope you can see. <clears throat> All right. All right. You know, curry. What is a curry? A lot of people will ask, what is a curry? Curry simply means like a combination, a sauce made with combination of different spices. You know, it doesn't grow on a tree. It's not a mix of something. It's just masala and curry just means a blended, nice sauce. And you can make sauce like 100,000 different ways, right? So there's so many different ways to make a curry. Today, we are going to make a curry which can boost the immunity. So I created this dish for the health workers. You know, I work with Feed Your Hospitals. And the first, I wanted to create something really, really nice. So as I'm talking, I've heated some oil here. I'm going to add chopped onions to it. Uh, chopped onions. So whenever you're making a curry, there are a dry trinity and a wet trinity. But on this one, I'm creating this by top five spices, which gives the boost to your immunity. Ginger, garlic, turmeric, cayenne and cinnamon. So it is delicious. And then turmeric is in here. So first what we do, do the wet trinity. Wet trinity is onion, ginger, and garlic. So that's what first you fry so that you can create a wet trinity. Now here, I have ginger garlic paste. And then I have the cinnamon cardamom cloves, the, the cayenne pepper, turmeric, this is the coriander powder, the cumin powder, and a little salt. So I'm going to start by adding the other ginger garlic paste to it. And just mix it up a little bit. It's very easy to make a curry, you know, it's just just so easy because what happens is you get afraid of all these different spices. You don't have to be afraid of it. It's very easy. Just remember three wet trinity, onion, ginger, garlic. Like one part onion, like three parts, sorry, three parts onion, one part ginger, one part garlic. And then when it comes to the dry trinity, it is turmeric, coriander powder, and cumin powder. So coriander powder is three parts, two parts cumin powder, one part is turmeric. So as it is, as it is, you know, frying, we're, we're going to add the dry trinity to it. So the dry trinity will be the turmeric, The ginger, uh, sorry, this is the cumin powder, the coriander powder, 
the it is the cinnamon clove cardamom and a little bit of cayenne one of the things when you are cooking with the spices make sure you have a little moisture in it otherwise it can easily burn so that is where the chopped tomatoes come in so you add the little chopped tomatoes in it to give it a little little body Add the chicken, right here. So, so far, it is so easy that because right now, what you can do is actually make a one pot meal. Because I'm going to add some different vegetables in it. But suppose you're at home and you want to just cook one pot meal. What you have to do is simply, after you add the vegetable, add a little rice. If you like pasta, add a little pasta and cook in slow fire. Then you can just serve that as a one pot meal. I'm going to add the carrots. Just going to add the cauliflower to it and some green peas. And this is how easy it is to make a nice immunity boosting chicken curry. Like it can't get any easier, you know? So it is important like what you are cooking because if I am going back into, for example, 700 BC and talking to you about one of the things which happened in pre-Vedic time. One of the important, most important message is you are what you put in your body. But it is very important to understand that and cook with something which is delicious but also nurturing and healthy. Now I'm going to add a little bit of water in it and let it cook, cover and cook for 25 minutes. And that's up. That's how easy it is. Yeah, it looks delicious, doesn't it? I'm going to cover and cook and let it cook for like 10, 15 minutes. Put these things away so that I can answer a few questions. I'm going to end it by some chopped cilantro. I'm going to keep it here with everything else in the back. There you go. You know, I definitely believe on certain things when you're cooking. See, one of the oldest human rituals is to hunt, gather, cook food together, sit around the fire, eat and share. What we are doing today is a modern version of it. The cooking together and eating together is one of the most important things you can do. It sustains you. On that note, I do want to tell you, when you are cooking, make sure you have love in your heart. You know, it's very, very important. When you are really mad at your partner and you are <laughs> cooking for them, it definitely have a different effect. But when you feel nurtured and you're cooking with love, you know, it kind of flows into the food. So if you are not trying to be a little neutral, and then it works because you definitely know 
food is nurture. So we do need the spirit of the food in it. So you can enjoy it and share that enjoyment. So let me look inside and see how it is going. Look, it's coming out really good. Everything is looking beautiful. I'm going to cover and cook. And, you know, this is a moment I want to take and say, that, well, in life, you are like in the middle of something like this, like COVID. What do you do? You have no idea what is happening. None of us is prepared for something like this. You know, we never they didn't teach this in the business school. It all happened 100 years back during the Spanish flu, and now it is happening in 100 years. What do you do? My most important thing in my mind, which I shared during my 30th anniversary, when everybody asked me, what keeps you going? What is the secret behind everything? I have to think about it because I had the speech made up. It was all really good. Like, you don't want to hear my speech? Like, no, we want to hear what makes you tick. What keeps you going? So I had to think about it. I came up with two things, and it applies today. The first thing is make life your secret ingredient. If you make life your secret ingredient, you're always enjoying it. And the second thing, which is really important, is every day, early in the morning, I wake up, and I decide to do the very best I can. And I'm okay with it. That way I can enjoy what I have achieved that day. And I don't want to beat myself up. And that's what keeps me going. So I'm going to check this again. This is a beautiful, like, you know, vessel because look. Really nice. You can see everything. This is ready. I can see the chicken is ready. Everything is ready. Beautiful. I usually end it with some chopped cilantro. A lot of people love cilantro. A lot of people don't. So it's a personal choice. And then we'll be ready to enjoy it. I hope you have already got your steam rice ready. And we are ready to eat. And that's how easy that was. And I hope you will try it at home and enjoy it and have an amazing time. So I'd love to see if anybody of you have any questions. I would love to answer those. And uh, we'll start yes. by putting it back to Kathy. Yes, Chef. Thank you, Chef Ranjan Day. That looked amazing, and I wish I could have been there to smell all that delicious curry that you're making over there. Uh, also, in my beard, you can smell it, and it's like, <laughs> I, know. I love it. It's smelly vision. I wish there was smelly vision. I could send it off to you. Yes, send it all over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm actually going to give you a couple questions that are related to the food that the audience wanted to know. Um, when you were making the curry, someone wanted to know what the original oil you were using in the pan. The oil which I use is canola oil. In our restaurant, we use canola oil because it has least amount of allergy effects. But you can use any kind of oil you like at home. You can okay. use favorite oil, cooking oil. 
you can use very light olive oil. You can use any kind of oil, as long as it's a neutral oil, and it doesn't take over the flavor of the curry. Okay. And then someone also wanted to know if, um, or how do you make your ginger garlic paste? I will take gin half ginger, half garlic, and just put it in a blender and just blend it. And it's easy and you can actually for home, you can just put little cubes in the freezer and just take out one cube at a time. Another way of doing it is put it in a Ziploc bag, right? Put it flat and then you divide it into four like so by pushing it down and then put it in the freezer. And then when you open it, you just take that, that just click that out, that one piece and put the rest of it back into the freezer. For us, we make it fresh. We make it fresh, but we use a lot of ginger, a lot of garlic, a lot of onions. We use about 50 pounds of onions every day. And I would say, uh, say about five pounds of ginger, five pounds of garlic, if not more. So we make a huge amount every day and have it ready. And then um, there's a lot of cooking questions. We'll yeah. ask maybe two more. Uh, one of them was, do you grind your cumin seeds into a powder? Yes, there are several ways we do it. I'm going to cover this so that it can stay nice or I can keep it open so everybody can see it. I'll just keep it open. Okay, so you see, ginger has many personas. By itself, uh, sorry, cumin has many persona. So by itself, it is flowery, you know? If you take cumin and just smell it, it's a little floral. Now you take that cumin seed and you put it in the oil to flavor the oil, it will become nutty in flavor. You take the same cumin seed on a dry pan and you roast it and you grind it. it will give you an earthy flavor. So you have so many different ways of actually using the same spice. Same with uh, mustard. Mustard I feel has a Jekyll and Hyde personality. When it is like whole mustard and you're cooking with whole mustard it's nutty in flavor. As soon as you grind it, it becomes pungent. So it has so many applications to that cumin seed. And then um, someone also wanted to ask about spices. How long can you keep them in sealed containers? You see spices has been used forever as long as you store it right. We have a spice company called New World Spices. I went into the history and dug out favorite dishes of three kings and three queens from six different regions and created the spice blends, you know, like all focused on a favorite dish of him or her. Now, when I put the spice container, it's made out of a, um, like a corrugated pipe with silver lining inside. So it is totally dark. Then when you have a top, which is airtight, it can keep forever. However, according to FDA rules, so that, you know, so that we can sell more, it says one year is the <laughs> lifetime on the shelf. When you look at a, at a spice jar in a store, look at the spice jar, jars on the top shelf, because those are the ones that doesn't move that much. Take a spice powder, turn it. Whichever is facing the light has discolored from the back, because the ultraviolet ray has bit it in the front, but the back will remain much darker in the front. That's why you should put spices in a container, which is dark, so the light doesn't hit it. So the color remains really, really good. Okay. 
I'm going to ask you one last uh, food related, cooking related question, because there's so many other great questions that people are coming in with that are related to you being a chef and how you got into it. So um, the last one is some restaurants curry sauce looks thick and creamy. What makes the curry sauce creamy? So there are hundreds and thousands of ways of making curries. Just like India is a country which goes back 5,000 years or more in written history. In the north, everything is different from south and everything is different from west and east. It has, originally, it had 26 states. Each state has its own language, own script, own dress, own cuisine, own uh, festival. So if you can imagine Europe put together in one country, so the cuisine is that varied. But curry, if anybody says curry, that means something Indian. But there is like, thousands of different ways of making curry. The creaminess originally came from the invaders who came to India through the Khyber Pass in Himalaya. These are the Middle Eastern people. Okay? They brought with them nuts and raisins and cream. They got inducted into the curry flavor and therefore up north is a, always a milder version of curry with more creamier texture. However, in south, we have yogurt, which has been added to the curries, but it is nice and pungent and very, very different texture. So it is the dish, depends on the dish, but you can make the curry creamier by adding yogurt, by adding onion puree, by adding, um, you know, paste of cashew nuts, uh, almonds, and then a little bit of uh, uh, pistachio. So there are different ways, depending upon which dish you're making and why is it creamy. Okay. Um, and someone also wanted to know that they've heard from Indians that there's actually no dish such as curry per se curry is that the case curry just means a sauce curry means a sauce so curry is not a like a spice which grows in a tree you know it's like saying sauce curry and so, okay what curry do you want like what sauce do you want and then basically you will make a chicken curry or a vegetable curry or this curry or that curry and then we add different names to it. Like butter chicken is originally from Punjab. And there is like butter in it, there's cream in it, there's tomato in it, and you make this tomato cream, butter, curry, or sauce. Madras curry is from Madras. You add coconut to it, you add chilies to it, you add a little bit of, you know, a mustard seed in it and make the sauce. So it's a Madras curry. So always the curry becomes something which you add at the end, which means the sauce. Great. So now we want to learn a little bit more about you, Chef Ranjan. Please tell us, how did you get into food? What motivated you to become a chef? Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I started when I was 14 in Calcutta. My dad was a officer in the federal government of India. I didn't think my mom is going to betray me and tell my dad because she knew I used to smoke. This is not an ad for smoking. I have given up smoking from the time I went to college. So he found out. He said, Babu is my pet name. You know, in India, everybody has a pet name. Nobody in India, close family, know me as a Ranjan. Everybody knows me as a Babu. The Babu, come! And I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> so he made me sit down and said, so, you have started smoking. I'm like, no, Dad, like, shut up. Go get a job. Smoke with your own money because you won't listen to me. 
So I used to, this was in ninth grade, I used to study in the Fort William High School, Central School, and one of my uncle was a shoe chef in the Park Hotel, the Five Star Hotel in Calcutta. I asked him if he would give me a job because I wanted to buy my mother some gold bangles. I didn't tell him I wanted to smoke cigarettes. So he said, sure, you can come, wash the floor, peel the potatoes, grind the spices, wash the pots, and you can do a gopher thing for two days a week. And I started like that. And after high school, I went into hotel management, catering technology and applied nutrition. It is a very intense course. In the batch of 74, uh, there was 2000 applicants, 40 seats and 28 of us graduated. And it teaches us, you know, everything, anything to do with hospitality, whether it's hospital, whether it's hotel, whether it's restaurant, whether it's ship, everything. So that's how I started. And then I worked in many, many hotels in India. Um, then I started the Sheraton chain in India. Then my dad became a diplomat. He was posted in Hong Kong. So he came to Hong Kong. So I came to Hong Kong to see my dad. And then there's a Harilela group of company who own all the Gaylords worldwide except the ones in India. There's 200 Gaylords in India. And they own all the master franchises worldwide that was 35 Gaylords in 12 countries. So they hired me to take care of those. And then I started another chain for them called Viceroy of India. That's where I met my wife, Cody, the Navy brat, used to manage a pub next door called Prince of Wales. I can easily say that I met her through Prince of Wales and Viceroy of India, right? Yeah. But then I started New Delhi in Hong Kong, 1982, first New Delhi. I had four New Delhi, and then the fifth one was here in San Francisco. Uh, we were expecting our daughter, Sarah, and that's when we decided to move here because my wife is American. Her mom and dad worked for US Navy. That's why she was there. And I'm Indian. So we wanted to make sure she has a sense of belonging. And then China was taking over Hong Kong in 1997. So I started this restaurant in 1988. And in about four years, I sold all my interest in Hong Kong and Bangkok. And here I am doing a Zoom cooking show. I'm telling you all about it. <laughs> And then um, somebody also wants to know what your absolutely favorite Indian meal is. Is it, you know, a, a, maybe a, a fond food memory you had when you were a child that you still treasure? A food memory? Like yeah. Um, just one of your favorite food memory, maybe something that you ate as a child that, you know, has stayed with you forever, maybe something that you don't get here anymore. It could be something your grandmother used to make you or something you had from a street vendor. Food memory is such a beautiful and important thing for me. You know, Kathy, being a chef, that food memory transports you on a, on a ride. You're instantly back where you know you suddenly remember those things my most you know important and very very delicious heartwarming food memory is what my grandmother used to feed for me in india when you are a senior and especially if you become a widow you wear white all the time in those days. And then you stop eating any non-veg items. And you only use, a, the food is cooked separately in the kitchen for uh, the senior. And it is only cooked with like simple things like turmeric, a little salt and ghee and cumin but no onion, ginger, garlic. Ginger is okay. No garlic and onion, but ginger is okay. Uh, because these are not hot 
spices. These are calming, cool spices. So usually there'll be a big pot of rice with a lot of root vegetables and other leafy vegetables cooked together with a little bit of salt, a little bit of turmeric, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, some ghee. So all the grandkids will just make a, like a semicircle in front of her. She will have a big plate. She will take a big amount of rice, mix it up with a little salt, a little bit more butter, and make it into a big balls and hand it to each one of us. And then she will make some for her own and eat. Then we'll all eat together. And that is one of my most delicious food memories. Um, I know we were talking earlier about how your daughter just had her sixth child. Um, do you have plans of making this, uh, you know, delicious dish that your grandmother used to make and sort of doing it the same way and sharing it with all your grandkids? I do. I al already do. I have, like, so uh, my sixth grandson was just born on 14th of August. So for the other grandkids, I make rice balls. And rice balls is their favorite. So I will make the rice ball and then hand it to each one of them and we'll all eat together when we are visiting. Yeah. And tea and cookie. So in the morning, all my grandkids will wake up and say, Dadu, Dadu is me, grandpa. Tea and cookie, Dadu. So I'll go make some tea and cookie, but there's going to be a lot of milk in it, a little bit of tea and cookie. And then we'll just dip and eat together. I love it. That sounds amazing. Um, another question for you is, have you seen Indian cooking change with the intro introduction of new ingredients and cooking methods? Um, this is something I also wanted to know, you know, being in business for over 30 years, plus in the San Francisco Bay Area, have you seen Indian cuisine change and evolve over time? And if so, how? Absolutely. You know, in everything in life, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. So with today's economy, today's inter, inter, internet and everything else, there is influences, worldwide influences in everything, also in cooking. So there is more than Indian cooking, which takes, you know, like a lot of Western style cooking and takes Indian ingredient and recreates it and does amazing job. Showcasing food in a beautiful way has become a norm. We do have Maharaja burger being served in McDonald's, which is a vegetarian burger. And, and there is like amazing number of vegetarian food in McDonald's in India, and it doesn't serve pork or beef or lamb, only fish and poultry. The pizzas over there, paneer pizza, this, that, everything is to die for. So one of the things I do, I, I haven't done it for, I would say at least four years. I take a group to India and it follows one of my you know, documentary series. If you go to YouTube, put My India with Ranjan Day, you can see it's a culinary cultural travel adventure. And I take them to India. So one year will be north, the other year will be south. And we'll take them on a food tour and everything else in between. And always I'll take them to one of this, you know, American chains, but in India, where they can have this delicious meal, but they're like, I have never seen anything like this ever. So yeah, it's changed in a big way, in a beautiful way. Um, and since you touched upon, you know, taking people on a journey with Southern Indian food and Northern Indian food, can you tell us and just a brief differentiation between the two types of um, Indian cuisine? Because I think we see a little bit of that in San Francisco, um, Southern Indian cuisine versus Northern Indian cuisine. Yeah, the Southern Indian cuisine uses totally different kind of ingredient and cooking style. It's a lot of like sourdough rice, batter, a lot of lentils, a lot of vegetarian food, 
much more spicier. Northern food is much more barbecue and then creamy curries and uh, you know naan bread and things like that. So it's differently cooked and styled. If you look at the number of restaurants all over the world outside of India, you will see 80 to 90 percent of them are North Indian versus Southern Indian. The reason is North Indian food is instantly palatable to any palate, whereas South Indian food, you have to get used to it a little bit, and then you start to enjoy the taste. Like people, I mean, I, we, we used to do, until the COVID happened, 50 Indian weddings every year. So creating a menu is very important for each wedding. You know, so when I create the menu, I have to ask them, what is your favorite dish or what is the background so that I can create something which will be a wow dish, at least one. Then we can have many other dishes. And it all depends upon, you know, like what they personally like. Like you asked me about the changes. You know, the most popular bird in India now is tandoori chicken. Because everybody loves tandoori chicken. So that's what I mean by that is everybody loves everything. So this way we can enjoy and be more inclusive than too exclusive, you know, and enjoy the offerings, which the which the amazing culture has to offer, the beautiful cooking, and the chef's interpretation of an art form. Um, you had mentioned Indian teas, and uh, one of the guests want to know the different kinds of Indian tea that there is. Maybe just a brief background on maybe a couple major teas that are representative of your cuisine. Yeah, there is so many different kinds of teas in India. The main tea growing region is in the northeast near Assam. So you get the Assam tea and they're black teas. But then there's so many different kinds of green teas there. The other one is in south in the Blue Mountains where they grow tea and coffee. Their tea is way more robust like the Ceylon tea because Ceylon is also was a part of India but now became Sri Lanka. You know? And their tea is also very robust. There is like 100,000 kind of teas that's happening. And it depends upon what kind of tea you're looking for. It's, it's, it's amazing. And we do have one of those, you know, during the South Indian tour, we'll go to one of those tea gardens. And you get to pick some. And is this, um, do you, is it, traditional to enjoy the tea on its own or with sugar and cream or milk because sometimes um when i go to certain indian restaurants they'll offer you i, I think it's like a masala tea or a chai tea and it, it has creamer in it it seems like it appears quite often so is that a normal way of having tea that's the main popular way of having tea chai chai basically means you black tea and you cook it along, let it boil with a little bit of cardamom, cinnamon, cloves, and a little bit of ginger if it is during the winter season. And then you add milk at the very end and sugar. The way we do it in New Delhi restaurant, we don't add the sugar, but we do everything else because people are you know, in tune with how much sugar they're putting in their body. And a lot of people are asking tea without milk, you know. So we do keep a few other varieties, but that is the most, most popular way. Anytime is a chai time in India. You go anywhere, they're going to offer you tea. And then, like, if you go to 10 different places, you're going to be offered 10 different teas. So then they tell you, cutting, bring me a cutting. Cutting means they will bring it in a small little jar, and cutting is half. So you can have two sips and make everybody happy because, you know, a host is offering you tea and saying no is not good, you know, it's not proper etiquette. So you say yes and take one sip and you're good. 
and it keeps me going all day long. And I don't do cutting, I do big ones. And then uh, someone also wanted to know if you are still helping and working with children in the Tenderloin and in India, they said they were very impressed with the work that you've been doing with them. Maybe you can share a little bit about that. Yes, our organization is called Compassionate Chefs Cafe. New Delhi restaurant transforms into a Compassionate Chefs Cafe during many times during the year. And every single cent raised goes to help the kids across the street in Tenderloin after school program and connect them with kids in Gandhi Ashram in Ahmedabad to become global citizens, just like you and me. Every seven years, we have a endeavor to bring 17 kids and seven chaperones from India to meet the kids over here. And it is a three or four year effort because these kids are from the slums in India. They don't even have food service. So we have a lot of volunteers. First, we have a center over there called Heart Center, capital H-E, and then capital A-R-T, is the art center with the heart. So all the kids, 3,000 kids can come and express themselves in different ways through the art form they like. Then we put together a dance drama with Mahatma Gandhi's, you know, like, One, only one race, which is human race. And we can overcome anything and everything in a nonviolent way. There was a 90 minute dance drama. There was about 300 kids who applied. We chose 21 kids. And out of the 21, six, 17 gets to come here. But it was such a struggle. I will tell you, there was this two very, very conservative family. They won't allow their daughters to do this at all because they said, none of our problem. We are going to get you married by the time you're 16 or 17. These are kids between 12 and 14. But we, we brought some other kids who came on this tour before and later on they said yes. So then they learned this dance drama, go perform in the slums in 11 different cities in India. And so it is not about coming here. It's always about telling a story. It is about a message. And then when that happens, they come here and we take over Zeller Bacal or the Mexican Heritage Center and they perform. And they go to the Tenderloin After Schools program. We have programs. And then they all come here and we have meals together and we have fun. That's wonderful. Um, Gosh, there's so many great questions. I'm going to probably ask you two more before we are gonna have to end it. So um, let's pick two more here. What is the most sought after dish um, that you prepare at your restaurant? What's the most popular dish at New Delhi? One of the most popular dish in New Delhi is called Bengali Kosha Manchu is a lamb dish cooked with mustard oil and potatoes and Bengali. <laughs> so that is something you don't usually get in most of the Indian restaurant, but it is a very popular dish in India. And so it is here. And then the other popular dish is, uh, you know, um, uh, spicy tamarind eggplant, which is, should I put? Amazing. Um, and then lastly, how do you get inspiration for the dishes that you serve at your restaurant? Do you have to travel back to India often or do you get inspiration from um, restaurants in the Bay Area? Inspiration for me can come from anywhere. It could be a billboard. It could be a dish. I am eating at Fangs. <laughs> it could be a dish somebody cooked for me. And then I just have to let my imagination, you know, like hold on to and create an idea. You know, I have 
my, the way I create is very, very, everybody has different ways of creating and not, I mean, and you don't create the same way all the time either. And, you know, it will, it will trigger certain, certain ideas to put together and create a dish. And that's how it comes about. You do need the base of understanding how to create texture, how the spices will work, how the presentation will work, and then everything works together. Okay, so I wanted to ask you something that I think everybody has been, you know, thinking about lately with COVID. Um, how has your restaurant and how have you personally been dealing with um, the pandemic thus far? And um, how can we all help small businesses such as yours uh, during these really difficult times? It is one of the hardest things which has happened to us. My core staff of six has been with me for 26 years. And I want to take care of them. So I am. The way it is working in the kitchen is I'll bring in three of my staff in the kitchen. I'll bring in, bring them in for two days and then alternate with another person for two days and then another person for two days. And in front of the house, I do the same thing with other three people, two days, two days, two days. Right now, I'm rediscovering. Like your restaurant, my restaurant is a luxury brand. It's about an experience. It's about coming and seeing me. It's about, you know, hearing a story and enjoying this amazing experience, which I can provide because dine-in is closed. So I am rediscovering myself. We never had delivery and pickup as our main, like, source of income. So we are redoing. We started a ghost kitchen or a, you know, like a uh, digital kitchen called curbside curry. And we have items there, nice and simple, but very, very delicious and very price friendly. And we are doing uh, delivery all over San Francisco for $3. And we are doing pickup. And then we have New Delhi restaurant menu also for pickup and delivery for $3, but it has all our specialties and things like that, but it is way more limited menu. I love for everybody to support us and spread the word and give us a chance so we can become sustainable. We are the oldest Indian restaurant in the city of San Francisco. We are a legacy business. The city of San Francisco recognized us as a business which makes what is the soul of San Francisco. This time is a crazy time for us and we need all the help we can So thank you for bringing that question up. And when did you, um, you know, when, the, when shelter in place was put into order, when did you decide to open up? Did you do it right after? Did it take you some time to, to gear up? It took us a little time. We closed the restaurant 16th of March. We started curbside curry. Um, Cody, my wife came up with that name. It's amazing, you know, curbside curry. And uh, we started that beginning of May. Beginning of May. It took okay. us a little time because I didn't want to just do the the first thing which came to mind for me doing it really well is important and making sure everything works together is important wow. so you know so that's why it took a little time and also when we open up the restaurant for dine-in i am going to wait for at least three weeks before i open up simply because in the very beginning there's going to be a second wave of covid and i don't want to put my staff in that jeopardy yeah. I want to learn from all the mistakes and all the change of, uh, you know, laws and everything which will come in place for three weeks and then I will open it up. This three weeks won't really make that big of a difference, but when it comes to life and death, it may. So I want to take precautions for my core staff. Absolutely. Yes, we have to take care of each other. Yes. And can you tell us um, where curbside 
uh, Curry is available, what cities? So some of our audience can know that. Pet Curry is available for pickup for the whole Bay Area. Curbside Curry for delivery is available for San Francisco. All over San Francisco. Is, is this through like a delivery app then? Um, like Caviar or DoorDash or something separate? Do they go to your website? It is our own. So we do our own delivery. Oh, wow. And, okay. And it's, it's under curbsidecurry.com. Okay. And Good. we are fortunate. We have been able to do piggyback on Postmates for all the deliveries. So it's working out for us. Okay. That's great. I mean, obviously, I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for all these small businesses such as yours and ours, because like you said, you know, our businesses, these restaurants, uh, it's, a, it's a historical piece within San Francisco. It's what makes San Francisco so unique and so special. And um, it, it's a, it, these, these are very difficult times for these restaurants and not a lot of us may be around after the pandemic is over. That's the scary thing. And we're all just trying to figure things out. So um, I'm happy to hear that things are going well you guys are able to come up with ways to to survive i truly believe every disaster has a seed of opportunity so we are trying our best to rediscover ourselves reposition and come out stronger on the other side we need the community's help to make it work you know without that we are nobody because we serve the community and that's why this is the time we need their help and I think we can do it together. You know, there was a business insider story. It said nine, no, 85% of all the independent restaurants are going to be gone. Yep. We don't want to be one of them. And we are here to stay. Good, <laughs> good, because I want to come in. <laughs> I want to come in when this is all over and indoor dining is allowed. We're going to, I'm going to request the rice balls and I'm going to bring my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know one day before I can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Chef Ranjan, for sharing all this time with us. Um, I'm going to send it over to Margaret now to give some closing remarks. Thank you, that was terrific, Chef Ranjan and Chef Kathy. We can feel the food experience through the screen. We really miss you guys. Thank you very much. Can't wait till you guys are open again. Uh, to everyone in the audience, please support our local restaurants. Uh, you can order takeout right now from New Delhi. I did it, you guys were very efficient. You were early with your delivery. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone in the audience again at Asia Society. All our programs now are virtual. Please join us, all our programs uh, from 13 centers around the world are all on our website. If you'd like to join us for this special reception, there was a second link that was uh, emailed to you right before this program. We're gonna click over there and uh, we'll join Chef Ranjan and uh, Chef Kathy. And I also want to thank our team. We tried some new technical tricks this time. So thank you to Rexel, Michael, Jamie, Polarp, and Heather uh, for making this happen. And from all of us at the Asia Society Northern California Center, stay safe.